three, two, we are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Welcome to the Lost Dollar Business Club. Business, business, business. This is the business show that everybody watches. This is where we discuss why businesses fail and why businesses succeed. Business, business, business. Business, business, business. Welcome to the Lost Dollar Business Club. <laughs> definitely change. You got to change that intro, my friend. That new like intro. That new intro, yeah. man. I'm going to have to re- do another voiceover. Well, the first one was really good until someone complained that we stole their music, and that was only right, 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 right. You started the show. Minor, minor yeah. copyright violations. You know. Yeah, but yeah. you well, years, like, like, said a yeah, word. If you have poor material, that's all you can work with. That's all. Wow. Oh. Wow. Okay. I'll one across the bow, now. Stephen. One across the yeah. bow. There you go. I'm only as good. I'm only as good as the crap people send me. You know. <laughs> okay. They talk right. about crap that I sent you. I sent you the whole new stuff for the trailer for the channel. Did you get that? I did, and that's already been updated. But you won't see it because you uh-huh. are subscribed. But it's actually on the it's actually on the playlist. It's been updated. Oh. Really? Okay. Content so that you, you can't know, get if you subscribe. I mean, did, I mean, did no, you did no, did, did didn't. you have time when you were lying in hospital doing nothing? I mean, come I on. Was, when I was in the hospital, I was in such pain. That the only thing I wanted to do was like just try to figure out if I needed to die or not. So, oh my god! And John <laughs> is the reason I went to the hospital. We're live, by the way, <laughs> and uh, just so like you know, look good. So, yeah, You're so live, right. hospital, the, the, your last thing, the, the last the last guest is waiting. Don, the guest last thing I cared room. about. Yeah, the last thing I cared about was looking at anything other than I was just laying there, just praying that they fix whatever it was, and then they fixed it, and then I, I left. I never had I never had to leave the emergency room. But it was an event. Wow. So, that, so there is still hope for the American healthcare system. I had, I'm, I'm going to shout out to this doctor just because he has a cool name. I, I literally thought he was making it up. He comes, he introduced himself as Dr. Coffee. And I joked with him, I said, I had you this morning. Um, and he laughed. He says, oh, okay. And so we're talking about that name, one. Never, I'm sure, right? His <laughs> first name was Lincoln. So my doctor was Lincoln Coffee. That was Lincoln his. Coffee. That was my doctor. Yeah. Lincoln Coffee was my doctor. Doctor Lincoln well, Coffee. Yeah. Coffee. Well, maybe maybe that. Yeah. Maybe that was the first thing that came to mind. You know, when they asked the father for the name of the child, maybe he had a cup which was leaking. And so we said, "We'll call him Lincoln Coffee." Oh, David. <laughs> I'm just uh, saying. You know, I'm, I mean, just, could just, be. just so we're clear, guys, you only have to deal with this one hour to an hour and a half every Friday. Is our, is, I have the. I have the fortune of every day for several hours. <laughs> I hope our guest is still in the green room. I hope he's our guest in the green is room. still in the green room. He has yeah, a Nunzio, he, yeah. He's, he's, emigr- he's emigrated, I think, is what it he's is. He's emigrated. Uh, and Rocco has his family, so he has to stay in the green room and do the show, and then we release the family. It's like what we do with all That's how it's done. Okay. At the Lost Dollar right, so, Business Club. At the Lost Dollar <laughs> Business Club. So, John, glad you can make it. You look well. Uh, you and David could talk football during Lost and Found. Michael, why don't you tell us who our guest is? Because I know this gentleman. Um, we met on an airplane, I think, going from um, uh, Abu Dhabi to Doha. So, okay. um, and then we hung out in the Michelin star restaurant that Qatar has, and we looked down on all the little people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, and he's, you, he's a great guy. You're the only one who does that. Oh, stop it. I tripped a whole bunch of people. Um, <laughs> but he's a wonderful guy. He has a great technology. He's the CEO of this company. But I'm going to let Michael go into it and very well, interesting got, stuff. We've got someone who's, you know, Jeff Dunkel of Optane Health, is, and which is an AI, uh, AI health assessment company. He's right. not only somebody who's built businesses in the healthcare space and actually has gotten things done, passed through Congress, uh, helped get things passed through Congress related to improving uh, health, the healthcare sector. But he's just generally a science innovation nerd. And so we've got somebody good to talk with about innovation in the, uh, in the healthcare AI space. Um, he'll talk a little bit about the company. And he'll talk a little bit about uh, just leadership and innovation and some of his, uh, his viewpoints on how he's built his companies and how he's, he's found uh, success in, in his career. So Jeff, this is this is I'm very excited. There he is. Hey, Jeff. Here, let's we'll do a close up. There you go. Hey, welcome to the show. Here we are. Yeah. Oh, wait, Jeff's standing. You're standing because of the back surgery, aren't you? 
I, I am. Yeah, my, uh, okay. <laughs> my uh, the, the rules are the rules are standing from here on out. So we can gotcha. And, uh, yeah. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Mm. Yeah, not a not, a not a bionic man who can't sit. No, 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 no. Uh, well, bionic, yes, uh, but I can't sit. Functionally, though, standing's good, right? It works. Standing's good. There you go. Yeah. There uh, you yeah. go. Well, great. I mean, so take us take us on a little journey. How did you How did you get to this point of working in AI healthcare assessment, health assessment? And, I mean, give us a little bit of insight into uh, into your connection to the health sector and innovation in Congress and the Senate. Yeah, it's been uh, uh, it's been quite the road. Um, yeah. So, I think uh, I think like most of us uh, that have found success, you kind of find it as you go. I don't think anyone puts a pin on the map and says, "I want to be an innovation guy that." Uh, knows how to work things through DC. Um, so, uh, you know, cut my teeth um, the way everybody does. Uh, at least coming out of the uh, out of college in the late '90s, early 2000s, you wanted you wanted to be in pharma. That was the place to go. Uh, and so I went there, and then quickly found out that wasn't where I wanted to be. Uh, but I liked some of the innovation things that I saw. Uh, I just wasn't very good at, at at kind of the the repeating the the message over and over daily to, at a bunch of clinicians. So. I got into the innovation part of J and J. Uh, worked on some really cool projects like PillCam, and then I got into laboratory diagnostics, which is just fascinating, right? If you if you really think about all these different uh, components that are in your body and the ability to look at analytes and these different measures and understand what's happening. Um, uh, asterisk, I think you already called me a nerd, so this is it's out there. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just reinforcing the message. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you 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 learn a lot, and so I um, you learn a lot about uh, how your body works, uh, and that then informs the care pathway on what we should do. And so um, <clears throat> I've been I've been like in, in just enthralled with this space, but also new technology and bringing it to market. I really just like status quo. Uh, I think the status quo, you know, having been on the inside of the mega companies, you know, the J&Js and Medtronics and, and of the small companies, your goal is to get the status quo because then you don't have to spend more money to continue to progress and improve healthcare, right? Uh, and those that, are, those that own the market, that's where they get to stay. <clears throat> and so if you want to improve the market, you have to be a disruptor. Uh, mm -hmm. And that means you need to be on the, on the nimble, innovative side. Uh, and then, of course, your goal is to get bought by the mega companies and then make that the status quo. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of a two-sided irony to that. Um, so anyway, so uh, worked with a company called Titan Spine after J&J. &J. It was nanotechnology, super cool stuff. The ability nanotechnology. To, yeah, the ability to manipulate uh, the surface of, a, uh, of metal at 125.4 millionth of an inch. Impossibly small. Can't see it with the oh. human eye. But at that level, we can... We can adjust and tweak what's happening to cells and make cells produce endogenously all these components that reduce inflammation, increase blood flow, speed up the process of bone healing. Uh, and we're talking like 30, 40 plus percent improvement in the ability to reform bone, right, or to heal uh, or to reduce pain because you've reduced inflammation. What, so, now, now what, what, as, a si as a side note, what, what happened to that nanotech? And we sold it to uh, we sold it to Medtronic. So okay, all right. So yeah. now that's that's becoming a status quo in certain areas. Yeah. So uh, again, again with the irony here, I now have uh, two implants in my back on the technology that I sold to Medtronic. <laughs> 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 Thanks to a slip disc. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, so glad I pushed that. Uh, I should say I glad a, a very talented team of individuals uh, pushed right. that technology through. Um, so we went through uh, we went through the White House uh, and got an award for best new technology with nanotechnology, and then uh, and then learned that we needed coding and um, uh, and reimbursement, which meant we had to have a category in the FDA, which meant we had to go to Congress and get some bills passed to give permission to the FDA and Congress to make these things happen. Uh, and so you know it was kind of a, now, why, now, you, why do you why do you need the code? Why do you need the code? Yeah, well, in in the healthcare sector. Right. Uh, everyone wants a 510K. That's the fastest way to get a product through and approved and get utilization. But on the flip side, there are supply chain within hospitals and their job is to drive costs down as low as possible. And what a 510K says is either I'm equivalent to or I'm not inferior to a predicate product on the market. And so supply chain doing their job is going to say, well, your regulatory claim says you're the same and therefore you can pay the same cost. 
mm. uh, right? Or, or you can you can read the same charge. Uh, and they're trying to manage margins at hospital systems that are three percent. So you can't blame them for trying to drive down costs, right? But if you're bringing something new to the market that's better, especially if it has a downstream effect that reduces costs or improves clinical care, you've got to you've got to figure out how to navigate it. So we decided at Titan's fine. Uh, we decided that we needed to pursue new codes. Number one, that creates a, a world of differentiation when you walk into a hospital administrator to say, these are not the same, they're not equivalent, they're not even the same category within the federal government register. Ah, okay. Right? Uh, and so that's that's the that's the first piece. It's, it's not easy to generate a new category within a regulatory body. <laughs> so uh, it took us years, uh, it took us years, but- That's a uh, tip, that's, that's a tip to, uh, to other healthcare companies trying to make it is the coding is important. Coding is very important, yeah. And even, even in my current company of Octane, right? Um, we, one of the first things we did was make sure that we retained the talent that helped generate CPT codes for the entire industry that we're in, right? So we understand the value of, of reimbursement, which kind of three things, we'll talk about this later, but there's kind of three things with any healthcare company, if you're young and innovative, that you need to be able to do. Number one is you gotta drive better clinical value, right? No one's gonna adopt a new technology unless you're bringing something that improves care to, to the market. Number two is you have to have fiscal benefit, right? So if I, if I have the world's coolest technology and it costs hundred thousand dollars and you look at the u.s and say there's 330 something million people here clearly we can't afford to apply that to all people but if you could bring a technology that was one dollar and you look at 18 percent of our gdp going into healthcare, and you could lower the cost and improve health care and that's going to be widely adopted so you have to find that balance uh, and then number number three is is fit form and function right you, you better deliver a product that can be used easily uh, because we we are just you guys have been to the doctor, right? And Stephen, I think you were saying you were just in the hospital. How much time did you get with one-on-one -on -one interaction with the clinician? First, typing on the side, entering something into the electronic health records so that something is right. documented correctly so that they can get reimbursed and not penalized, right? Correct. Yep. So, um, so anytime you're looking at any company in healthcare, those are the three things you have to look out for. So that takes takes me back to your original question, Michael. So, so what the heck did you do? Yes, yeah, so we went through the process of establishing a new category, establishing new codes that validated the ability to get in and get beyond the uh, um, the fence of supply chain, get our product utilized. We just saw that hockey stick adoption and then we got purchased by Medtronic pretty quickly after that. Nice. Okay. And I mean, so now now tell us a little bit about Optane because this is, is, this is something that could be on the ho hockey stick too. Optane. Hey. It is, uh, it is definitely on the hockey stick. Uh, I spend all day, every day, either talking to investors about our Series A because we're so far over our skis commercially that we need more money to support our kind of significant growth. Um, uh, uh, or I spend time on the phone with healthcare providers asking when we can have this uh, in, in our locations. So uh, just a, a wonderful predicament for us to be in. Uh, if you're going to be in a pickle, this is the one you want, uh, so to speak. Yep. So Oculomics, um, the eye is, is this just immensely fascinating organ, right? Um, within the eye, and I guess, let me take a step back. We've all been to the doctor where they take the little light and they get right in your face and, and you can smell what they had for breakfast because their <laughs> breath is, is right there at your nasal passage, right? What they're looking for is, is you can actually look uh, through the eye into the back, which is called the fundus. And, and, and from this, from this um, perspective, you can see cardiovascular components, right? So arteries and veins at a microvascular level. You can see two components of the central nervous system where the optic nerve comes in and the optic cup. And then you can get a, a really good understanding of the sensory system, specifically the eye, right? And are there, uh, are there um, lesions or other, or other problems that would cause potential blindness? It's such a unique vehicle though because it's non-invasive for us to look at. We don't need a blood draw. Right? We don't need a CT scan. We don't need anything that's going to cause harm. So the field of oculomics is the ability to look at all of these biomarkers within the eye and then to use artificial intelligence to interpret what's going on in the body. Uh, so the eye is not just the window to the soul anymore. It's the window <laughs> to the body. It's, it's, yeah, it's a predictor of health. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's, ex that's exactly right. Um, super cool stuff. And so um, when, uh, when I got a phone call from, uh, from Northwell Health System, which you guys probably know, one of the 10 largest in the United States saying, 
There is nothing in the market right now. There, there are AI companies in the market. There are camera companies in the market, and there is nothing that's meeting our needs. We have this really amazing scientific-based organization out of Australia that is the literature uh, and scientific um, lead in the space, but they haven't done a lot from a commercial standpoint. Uh, and we're thinking about putting a big investment into them, and, and, and we'd love to understand if you're interested in coming and running the company. Um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, that wasn't exactly the way it went, but pretty much, right? Um, let's, let's, let's see if we can do something special. And so you go on and you start looking up, you know, Professor Ming Wong He, and you find out this guy's got a H index of 80. I don't know if you guys know what an H index no, is. No, what is an H, no, index? an H index? So, uh, so in the in the medical community or in the in the um, uh, in the PhD community, when you get published and then your publish is referenced, mm. that, that combines for an H index. So, an H index of eighty means he's had at least eighty publications, each of which have been referenced at least eighty times in other people's right. Oh, wow. math. So, like a twenty should get you a tenured position at Harvard. Right. 80 wow. He's unheard of, right? So you look at you look at an individual like that, and, and you and you start pinging back and forth, and the and the the tree of researchers that kind of come off of the off of him at the top, and you say, man, we can do something special with this company. That's so amazing. That, so, so now, I mean, so oculomics, I get that now. I mean, using using this non invasive look into the eye, which is already uh, an amazing thing. What kinds of diseases can we see now versus what you think we can be able to detect in the future? Here, let me show you. I don't know how to, let me see if I can uh, share a screen and I might, that might make it easier. Uh, I'm not a death by PowerPoint guy, so um, you're going to get like one. We can, we can actually, we can actually share a screen. We know how to do that. We, we can we share a button. screen. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So the, the center image is actually a picture uh, of, of your eye, right? And so what you, wow. what you, of uh, the back of the eye. And so that bright, uh, that bright uh, white piece, that's where the optic nerve and the optic cup come in. Uh, to the left is the leading cause of blindness in the world. This is diabetic retinopathy. And what you're seeing in this image is our AI's ability to use heat mapping, similar to what, uh, similar to what other AIs do for cancer and MRI, to identify, uh, to identify outliers and features that, are, uh, that normally should not be there. And then on the right, it's called vessel segmentation, right? And so this is where we're taking uh, this is where we're taking your arteries and your veins, and we're mapping out. Uh, so in, in that center picture, there are all these little dots and all these little labels. That's where your arteries or your veins have pivoted or changed. They split. Uh, there's an artery or vein that's, that's closing or crossing over one another. And so we have layers and layers and layers of AI that takes the that take these biofeedback um, um, scenarios and say, oh, this person has diabetic retinopathy. Uh, you need to go see an ophthalmologist. This person has glaucoma. This person has um, age-related macular degeneration. So these are all eye diseases that cause blindness. But then on the flip side, we can look at your microvasculature and say, you have a risk um, uh, of high, medium, or low, which is the World Health Organization standards. You have a risk of cardiovascular events. And, and we all know that cardiovascular events is the number one killer in the world. Uh, and so we want to kind of get ahead of we want to kind of get ahead of uh, uh, of, of those cardiovascular events. So Steve, Jeff, you, you, I mean, you showed now that you showed that that great view of the uh, of the retina, the back of the eye. Um, you got to settle a debate on the internet with Andrew Huberman. Okay, he has <laughs> he has said Andrew Huberman has said that the eye is part of the brain because the back of the eye is the you know the optic nerve and is connected to the brain. So he says when you look into someone's eyes, you're looking into their brain. And, uh, and I argue that just because the back of the eye is part of the brain because of the optic nerve, it doesn't make the whole eye part of the brain. So what do you think, Jeff? Is the eye part of the brain or what? Ooh. Boy, <laughs> I, I hate to argue with Huberman. That's one smart dude. Uh, that, that, that's one smart dude. I'm not talking to you, Michael. I just, uh, uh, I, just uh, I know his podcast. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk through this uh, and, and see if we can arrive at a middle point. <laughs> when, when, we're, when, when we're conceived, Right, and I don't think we need to go through conception. We've all figured that part out. Right? Can we? Can, wait, wait. Can we go through that? Because John doesn't know. He still thinks oh. the stork brought him. So if we can go through the conception, <laughs> then that would be awesome. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so, uh, so watch, watch how I just slide right over that one, Stephen. Um, no uh, when we're, when we're conceived and we start to develop embryonically, right? Yeah. The same cells that form our brain form our eyes. 
Right? Ah, okay. Uh, so, you know, so we start splitting off. And, and so it, what I would agree with uh, from, from Dr. Huberman on this one is um, the, um, the physiology of the eye is very close to mimicking that of the brain. So number one, okay. the, the optic nerve uh, and, and uh, the optic nerve is a part of the is, is a functional part of the brain. Right? Right, right. That's number one. Number two, certainly, uh, certainly the uh, the central nervous system that attaches directly to the brain. And it's the only area where we can see that. Uh, you can see that t- yeah. But number two, the blood vessels that are in the eye directly mimic those that are in the brain. Right. Wow. Uh, so the microvasculature and, and the way that we can assess and understand nutrients and what's getting mm-hmm. in, right, um, they, they directly mimic that of the brain. And so, well, and you so know, that, I, yeah, I think, so then with that, with that, he's probably right. I wish he'd explain more to his <laughs> audience in the way well, that you just did. So, Jeff, well done to add on to uh, Andrew Huberman's uh, explanation there. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go against the uh, uh, the naysayers who are gonna argue that this is part of the sensory system, right? And we've had this classification of how organs fit into the body. Yes, certainly. Oh, physio- right? Physiologically, it's but it's physiologically. Kind of different ways. I, I think it would be very hard to argue against the similarities between the two. How about that? Really? Well, and this very this cool. may be uh, this may be that was very politically stuff. correct. Yeah, that was very politically correct, and we didn't offend anybody. I mean, other than the storks, but uh, we're good. Right. Yeah. I can't believe this guy got something passed through Congress in a bill. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, who knew? Hey, I mean, here's a question, because when you and I spoke about when we met and when you were using your technology and whatnot, so in the future, what do we think this type of technology or your technology will do when it, you know you put the little glasses on, so to speak, and it starts looking into my eye to see good, bad, or indifferent? Um, do we think it will can help people with cancer? Do we think it'll help people with other diseases? I mean, like what's the end goal other than we put this on and we can do X. So where is, where is it today? And where do we think it'll be say five or 10 years? Yeah, I've really gotten to know some very talented um, uh, ophthalmologists uh, over the course of uh, the last year or so in running this company, right? And spend a lot of time talking through uh, this process. So that the, the the CEO of the largest tele-ophthalmology group in the United States uh, and I, uh, this is a group called IPAX, have become pretty good friends. And he has this long list of things that he can see off of a single image, right? And we run through it. And yes, the answer is um, the abnormalities that associate with cancer, the ability to understand common and rare eye diseases, cardiovascular components, et cetera. Um, I, think, I think the big one right now, I think the first one is going to be cardiovascular disease. And I think what we're going to see is a, a, a transition that moves from uh, from risk assessment, you you are a high probability of having a major cardiovascular event in the next five to ten years. I think we're going to get into a state of currently what's going on in your body from a cardiovascular standpoint. Things like uh, atherosclerosis, things like uh, um, things like um, uh, hypertension, right? Um, coronary artery disease. The ability to walk into your clinician's office and take an instrument that looks like this, right? It's a dollar and a half long and a dollar wide, kind of like an Oculus, right? right. Uh, and look into this device, uh, have an image taken before a clinician ever walks in the room uh, and understand what's going on in your body, that's the future. And it's not far out, right? These, these devices yeah. are being placed on a regular basis uh, across the globe right now. So now it will be how much more detail can we get? How far down yeah. into, the, into the chain and what is the downstream impact? So if if we can diagnose uh, a problem, identify a disease state, and at the primary care level, create the care pathway, we can save months and months and months. And that's that's interesting to payers. That's interesting to uh, clinicians. There are a lot of clinicians that get tired of the referral pattern out only to find out that someone is negative, right? And I could have been treating a patient that really needed care. And instead, I'm instead I've got 80% of the people coming to my office where I look at them and say, you're fine. Get out of here, Right. right? No one wants that. Everyone wants the people that need care in the hands of the people that can provide care. Okay. Right, let me be the naysayer here. So everything I've read about doctors and whatnot, because there's no money in it anymore, apparently, right? So they get money from big pharma for putting out descriptions, are giving you drugs, and they do this and that. And most of the doctors, there's only a handful. And as we said, Dr. Coffee was one of the handful. But a lot of the doctors I've come across really just want to get you in and out and could care less. So as your technology or as AI technology improves, do we think it's going to take a while before it becomes adoptable, if you will, at a hospital where their goal is to actually make as much money as they can 
more than try to heal you, if you will, or at your doctor's office and whatnot. I mean, because this, in theory, in 10 years, can make a lot of doctors and a lot of big pharma go away. Because if I can say, listen, you just eat, I'm being somewhat facetious, more spinach, and you're going to be fine, that does no good for a lot of people, right? So how do we look at this, not just not in the United States, globally, I know like in Asia, they'll use this all day long because they just want you healthy. But in the United States, we're, you know, greed is good, make money. So what's our, how does that outlook look? Holy smokes, we got a lot to tackle in that statement, Stephen. Uh, so let's okay. let's start. Let's start from the beginning. Number one, I, I disagree. I don't think that any doctor wants to get you through. I think that's a necessity okay. of the business model that they live in. I think almost every doctor wants to be a clinician, right? First, uh, but like all of us here, right? They're also trying to figure out how do I make a profit out of out of the business uh, that I've chosen to go into. Um, uh, second is uh, I don't think you can replace clinicians, right? So we had this. Uh, really fascinating um, HHS Committee on Innovation uh, that I was on. Um, and there was uh, uh, Admiral Jawai at the time was uh, the OASH secretary um, for HHS and directly under him was a, a guy named Paul Reed. Uh, and, and Paul, uh, uh, Dr. Captain Paul Reed, I don't know which one he goes by officially, um, was, uh, was uh, sitting in a room one day and he said, you know, um, I think the biggest problem that we're looking at is instead of we keep trying to address the disease state farther down. What we need individuals to do is, you know, live healthier lifestyles, eat, uh, eat, you know, good food, et cetera. And he's exactly right. I, in, in that meeting, I said, that's while that's correct, until we require a doctor's prescription to pick up a Big Mac, we can't stop this cycle, right? So, so now it becomes how quickly can you inform the patient in order to try to stimulate a, a lifestyle change? So to your question on, like, does this adoption change things? I think it does. Right. I think any any time that you can get out in front of a disease state uh, and you get to help to to dictate a change or a pattern. Right. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and, and also, you know, I'm on a committee for for medical device epidemiology. Right. And, and at the FDA. Right. Uh, just this, you know, you talk about the, the nerds. This is like nerds unite. Right. This is our superhero force group. And, and we look at these things. We, we can see patterns and changes where. Uh, the introduction of uh, of some form of intervention or some form of a test lead to downstream improvement. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm 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 bullish on the fact that uh, that early screening uh, and regular screening leads to better care. I think in in spaces like cardiology and blindness, like the the disease states that we've picked for our company, these are disease states that if you catch uh, if you catch something early enough, you can many times stop the progression. Or oftentimes reverse uh, the pattern, right? There are other areas where you're never going to do that, um, and so you're just trying to slow progression, and that's okay too, right? Whatever we can do to kind of improve the overall health, healthier individuals also cost less, right? So selfishly, as a taxpayer in this country, uh, where we have uh, out of control medical spending, right? I sure would love to see people get healthier um, for, for my own wallet's benefit. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100. percent I was just from what I've seen. When my mom was going through it and other people, I'm like, really? You know, it's like pills, 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 pills. They don't really care. I mean, and this may just be where, you know, she was in South Florida. So I was underwhelmed with the health care that people of a certain age get where, and, you know, now it seems that we're coming up with all this great stuff. And it's wonderful if, it, if, if the doctors and, the, and big pharma and hospitals will adopt to it. You know, we don't have enough. We, we don't have enough time with patients. I mean, I think everybody understands that, right? And so you're right. uh, when you're when you're on a clock and you're and you're you're thinking about a CPT code nine nine two one three, right? And you're trying to you're trying to think through and say, okay, I've got eighteen minutes to spend with this patient, and I'm going to put six minutes on chart review, and I'm going to put four minutes into documentation, right? right, right. Uh, so that leaves me eight minutes with this patient, right? You're never going to go through the thorough. Uh, medical investigation of what's going on in your body that that we all had growing up in the. Well, yep. I don't want to time anyone, but like so, you know, I'm a child from the '70s, right? So uh, when I went to the doctor, we we sat and talked for a long time. Things have changed, right? We're now on the clock, uh, uh, and you can almost see that little red light flashing, like a comedian standing on stage, right? And in the right. background, it's like time to get off the stage and go tell another joke in another room. Uh, right. And that's kind of what we've become. The business of medicine says you've got to turn and burn uh, in order to right. stay alive. So um, I don't put that on the doctor. I put that on the I put that on the system. Um, okay. But I do. But I do agree with I, I do agree with the outcome, which is that model creates 
um, creates a scenario where you're looking less and less into what's going wrong with the patient and you're just trying to triage the reason that they came into the door. And right. the easiest right. thing to do then is to say, man, sorry about, sorry about your toenail, right? Here's some clippers. Right. Sorry about your headache. Here's a pill. Sorry about whatever it is. And, uh, and it, and it becomes very prescriptive in, in, in form, right? Right. That's what I say in Asia. I know when you go there, they it's like it's the old school. And then it, now they have the concierge doctor, of course, where you call and you pay stupid money, and they come like the old days when the doctor would come to your house when you were sick. So right. I'm I'm a, I'm a earlier child of this on the seventies, and I'm talking of like the seven the year seventy CE, not like nineteen anything. So, <laughs> you know, back in the day when they came with their little stone tablets. Um, so it's a little different. So watching the change over the last umpteen years is fascinating to me. And it really is people are becoming cattle. Yeah. Well, so that, I, mean, that really is, uh, I, I had a scenario and I, I went to, the, I don't very, luckily don't very often go to the doctors, but I went and I said, well, you know, this, this is what, this, this is what is happening. Okay, fine. <laughs> and I said, and I said, and this, he said, we can't talk about and this because I've only got 10 minutes for you. <laughs> it, listen, I'm the joke. So he said, if you have, there's something else you want to talk about, you have to make another appointment. And I was absolutely staggered because, you know, again, you know, when I was a child, the doctor would come to the house and, you know, you go to the doctor's surgery and you had like, you know, 15, 20, 20 minutes to, to talk about why you were feeling, you know, not too bright that day. And now it seems literally, as, as Jeff was saying, to my amazement, one question, 10 minutes, two questions, double book. If not, you can't ask. The second question. Yeah, we put a lot on <clears throat> we put a lot on documentation, right? So in the past, you would yeah. it was kind of an honor system. Um, I'm going to go in, I'm going to see my doctor. They're going to say I was with you for 22 minutes, and that's a that's an add-on payment that goes to an insurance company. And now the insurance company writes back and they say, well, that's not necessarily that wasn't necessary. You should have you should have contained this within 18 minutes. We're only going to pay you for that period of time. Right. Oh, West, so you said that the, the pushback's coming from the insurance company then? It comes from all over, right? But yeah, so you'll, they'll look and say, well, you didn't you didn't document concomitant diseases, right? We, we didn't see any comorbid conditions, right? So, uh, yeah. so the complexity of this patient should have been one that you could have gotten through on this period of time. And therefore, no matter how much time you spent with them, we're going to pay you somewhere in the range of $45 to $55 for that. Uh, for that time period and so what happens we spend all of our time trying to document and just justify and that's why you know we go to the doctor and your head's down in the computer make a little bit of eye contact yep yep head down in the computer right <clears throat> um uh, when when was when was the speed of typing ever the thing that we thought doctors would hold the most value in, right <laughs> so the faster you type the more time i get the extra 30 seconds right. um so yeah i i do like the um it's one of the things i did like about the um uh, about the uh, value-based uh, model, right, where you're building from the ground up, is it actually rewards clinicians for understanding the patients a little bit better, right, right. and spending more time keeping them healthy. I, I think that's, you know, things get lost in translation, and, and regardless of what side of the political aisle you sit on, uh, this concept that if I can keep this patient healthier, I make more money, is a smart move in trying to change a pattern that we've been seeing in, in healthcare for a while. Well, but I noticed why, at the why hospital would, that they why would you make the more, sorry, now. Sorry, Steve. Why would you make more money but, if the if the patient is healthier than Jeff? What they got, that doesn't seem to be. <laughs> yeah, you get you get a you get a uh, in in in, in value based care models. You get a big bucket of money, and you say, "Hey, I want you to maintain these, you know, uh, five thousand patients for your clinic yeah. as X number of providers, and we're going to give you this bucket of money, right?" And yeah. how you manage those patients. Uh, okay, that way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So the less so, you see them, the more money you have. Well, or uh, or the healthier they are. Right. Yeah. Uh, so okay. so you can you can spin it two different ways, uh, David. I think I think you could say the less you see them, but remember that within those systems there are metrics and requirements that that the clinician has to do certain things for certain disease state. I'll give you an example of that in just a second, right? But um, you have to maintain and improve. The overall health of your patients in order to make in order to make the bonuses that actually really kind of drive their health care so is, is, you know, is that what they teach them at med school these days then uh, to, you know i mean i think i think most people come out of med school uh you know thinking i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna save the world uh one individual at a time right with, with, my, yeah. with my stethoscope and my prescription pad and we're gonna do some good things and uh and then they get quickly bonked in the head by the realities of the system that we set up 
right? And you got to figure out how to swim, right? You're kind of thrown in the deep end of the pool. Um, so I'll give you an example, uh, David, because you mentioned it. Um, how do you know if you're doing a good job? So like in my space, diabetic retinopathy, the world's number one cause of blindness. For the federal government, if you don't screen for this uh, once a year for every diabetic patient that you have, there are things called HEDIS penalties that fall under national quality health system standards, right? So a diabetic patient, you need to have a percent A1C, you need to have nephrology to make sure your kidneys are working, uh, some, some blood workups, and then you need to have an eye exam to make sure you're not going blind. Because once you go blind, you're considered disabled, and once you're disabled, you're now on government's dole, right? You're no longer participating in doing uh, major events that lead to tax generation, right? Um, so you're on the other side. <laughs> so, uh, so the government said, enough of this. We're going to make sure that you do this testing, and they use what's called HEDIS penalties, uh, and they put HEDIS penalties in place. So if you have a diabetic patient and you don't do those three things, your penalty is up to $17 million per 100,000 patients. So if you do quick math and you've got uh, 10 to 12 percent of the U.S. population that's diabetic, so that's 32 to 36 million people, uh, and multiply that by divide by 100,000 times 17 million is around five billion dollars in penalties. If my if my head if, if the coffee is working right this morning, right? So uh, so if you've got five billion dollars of penalties, that should be driving people to get adoption. But if your technology doesn't meet fit, form, and function, and I can't squeeze that test into that 18 minutes for the clinician. Now I have expense on the back end. I'm better off taking the penalty, right? And so a company like ours, we look at it and say, hey, can we get a test? So we spend all of our time, all of our AI, trying to develop something that a clinician doesn't have to perform, that an MA can do before they walk in the room, and that lasts less than 60 seconds in engagement. <coughs> is this, is this, Jeff, is this, is this for Medicare patients or? Because how, how do you? All patients. You, huh? uh, Ninety percent of the payers in the market, including the pi the private payers, adopt HEDIS measures. So it doesn't matter where you are. Every single diabetic in the United States, if you don't treat them within this prescription, and there's other disease states too. The most most common disease states are usually the ones that get penalized. Um, um, and then on the flip side, there's reimbursement too, right? So if you run this test, we're also going to give you an additional fifty bucks. So you think about that from a provider standpoint <clears throat> and you say, I'm getting 50 bucks for my code for sitting in there with a patient. But if I did this diagnostic tool to understand my patient better, I get another $50. So now it really does become, can I run this test functionally? What's the cost to do that, right? Can I at least break even? And those are the, those are the thought processes that go through, you know, the office managers and the administrators. <coughs> Excuse me coffee down the wrong spot, um, the administrators of, of major health systems, how do I minimize penalties and maximize reimbursements while driving better clinical value and while not causing a clinician to spend more head down time typing, right? This is the riddle that you're constantly trying to solve. And if you're good in innovation, you're always, you're always looking for the solution that brings that to the table. Gosh. Yeah, don't right. die on the show, Jeff. I mean, we've had people die, but not literally. So don't die on the show. It's, it's bad publicity. It doesn't, you know. So I'm just saying. So. so now we know you're raising your round A. So let me just make this statement. So if you're watching this and you think you may want to invest in your VC or single family office or whatever you might be. So we, our little disclaimer is you have to talk to your accountant, your attorney, your sugar baby, your wife and your mistress and your girlfriend um, before you make an investment decision. Or if you're just a really rich person that wants to live forever. Here you go. If you can't find Jeff, reach out to us. We'll put you in touch with him. Um, but it's our little disclaimer so nobody can say that we said this is a good or bad investment. So, um, but but Jeff's technology and there's other things that he's told me that I'm I'm not going to say publicly that when we first met in over in the Middle East, who they were testing, and they didn't tell them when they tested this person what he had, and they told him everything that was kind of wrong with them. And they were, his doctor was like, yes, that's exactly true. And there was, so that was fascinating to me. This is how this all um, started, that their technology can really benefit people. Not that so much, I'm assuming it works, right? He's got like six or seven hospitals that are with him and doing things constantly. Yeah. But the fact that you can go and get, put it on somebody and you say, here's everything wrong with you. And the doctor's like, that's spot on. So I thought that was fascinating. So I, I think what this so is, you, is, it is the future. Are you seeing traction, Jeff? Oh yeah, we guys. We um, 
the whole reason we're doing a fundraise is we we were launching our camera. We thought it would be a soft launch. We figured we would go through these regulatory processes and <clears throat> and kind of stage things out. <clears throat> that was what the original funding, the seed funding, was for. Uh, and then we launched, and it turns out we have the best devices and the best AI, <clears throat> and we drastically underestimated the economic, the, the the commercial impact. So we hit our entire year's goal for both instrument sales and revenue at the end of February. <laughs> no, uh, wow. wow. Right? Yeah. I, got a, I, got a, I got a sales team of two and I got to figure out like how in the heck do I scale this thing faster? Uh, so we've got uh, major societies that have come on board that have said, you know, we're going to kind of like endorse and work with your future development. We've got uh, five new patents in, in spaces that we've talked about uh, today that all hit at the end of last year. It's just, we're just, our trajectory is like this. I've tripled the size of the team. We've had to flip offices three times to meet the growth. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a big fan of, uh, from an investor standpoint, on time and on budget, right? right? Every meeting, every investor meeting, every board meeting starts with we are on time and we are on budget. And the only way that you can do that is to make sure that you don't get so much scope creep that you lose the money that you initially needed for pick a cause, right? And so we made a decision in the uh, in the first quarter of this year that the only way to maintain on time and on budget and capitalize on this growth and drive the next development was to go ahead and move to a Series A probably a year earlier than we anticipated. Um, and so we're we're probably three or four months into that process. It is a funky market. You guys probably know this, right? We have a lot of individuals that are uh, kind of sitting on the side. We have a lot of interest. Uh, we have half of our round uh, committed to, which I think is, is pretty good three months in. Uh, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, but we're actively working to make sure that we secure the lead and close the round because I want to get back to work, right? I, I mean, yeah. the, the nerd in me says, let's get better science and let's, just, let's deploy this um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, the, problem you make is, sir, you, yeah, the problem when you raise money is everybody's like, I'm going to put money in. And you're like, this is great. And then they're like, but who's your lead? And they, want, they don't even care if it's a name. They just need someone to come in and go, we're going to do the valuation because that Jeff's got a number, right? I'm, I'm making numbers up here. So please don't take this as real. Jeff's saying, we're worth $100 million. And, you know, and everybody's like, no, you're worth $5 million. I'm not, we're 100 So they want somebody to come in and whether they hire a specific company to come in and do it or they've got 14 guys with pocket protectors and glasses to come in and go, we've done this. And in our market, you're worth this much money. And everybody goes, that's great. Now they have a lead and they can all invest. And then the Series B whatever. So getting this done is, is mammoth. And that I know having, yeah. having done this in the past. And so when Jeff and I've been talking about it, it's very, it's, it's like an OBTW. So you just need someone that says, I'll either pay for the valuation or be, right. I'm going to step up to the plate and be the valuation. Um, and that's yeah. sometimes a pain in the, a pain in the butt. So that's right. And well, I think it's a, I think we're also an interesting company, right? We're most right. most of the time, there's a camera company, and they're independent yep. from the AI company, and they are independent from distributor channels um, and teleophthalmology. Right, they're all different, and and that's part of the confusion that happens in the space. And that's why only 10% of the time do patients get imaged for diabetic retinopathy and other disease states in the primary care. They all get shipped out to ophthalmology. Not everyone goes every year, and then you get these massive penalties and loss of revenue. Right, <clears throat> so. Sometimes innovation is just about simplifying complex problems, right? I mean, clearly the AI, layers and layers of AI is really cool and innovative, but sometimes it's just about, can I deliver a solution that we really need in a fit form and function that works within the care pathway, within the, within the workflow of a primary care clinic, which is where these patients are. Um, and so that's, <clears throat> so that's, that's part of that evaluation, Stephen, is, how do you how do you price someone who's the only one, uh, really only company in the market that's providing all of those services in a single uh, in a single agreement that, that has ownership on on the camera? It's, it's tricky uh, and it's fun. It's exciting. It's great to have the conversations. Uh, but yeah, if you're if you're out there and you're a lead, we'd love to talk. Uh, ping me. <laughs> there you go. In the audience. In the audience. In the, the audience. audience. And listen, since it's a global show, we have global people watching. Like I said, if you can't figure out how to get in touch with Jeff, get in touch with the show. We'll put you in touch with Jeff. So not to worry. So that's very cool. Fantastic. Very good. Well, Jeff, I, I that's it. I that's think great. for you. I mean, I mean that in the nicest sense. I mean, you know, hopefully I'll, <laughs> I'll we'll catch you on another flight to Doha so we can go have uh, more sushi. So that sounds great. That, that sounds yeah. great. 
Gentlemen, it's a been pleasure. A yeah, thank it's you, good Jeff. To see you, thank you, Jeff. Glad you're feeling better. Uh, thank, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Great, great Cheers. Me too. Oh, Cheers. Bye-bye. Right. All right. So Jeff, guys, let's come just, off screen. Let's, Jeff, we'll let's just, just uh, let's figure Jeff. Wait, I'm going to kick him from the studio. So there we go. Let's let okay. Jeff go. Right. Jeff's got work to do. He's got to raise money. Yep. That's right. So he's got uh, things. And, he wants and so, so question for... Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. I got a question for you, David. Yes, yeah, right. sorry, John. So, you you're having that problem with your doctor and you're in the so in basically you know in a free socialized medicine and so on am i am i correct no no it's, no, it's all it's all privatized here it it's all private it's not so it's not like nhs in the uk no in the uk is all in the uk is 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 free at point of um well you know when you need it here i pay a phenomenal amount of money uh, insurance money every month Wow. For uh, for healthcare. Wow. Okay, all right. Just because I wasn't, you know, you know, I wasn't sort of, uh, I was under thinking that, oh well, that's a different model. So how come they're not giving you the time when you go to NHS? Do do you get the, the time, or is it the same as in Holland? I I haven't. Luckily, I I have not. Luckily, haven't been able to, haven't wanted to use the NHS in the UK because I don't ah. live there. Although as a British citizen, I still have free access to it. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, I have a friend who's been waiting for a prostrate. Uh, yeah, the cancer. waiting time is is the um, issue and he's and he's he's had a piece of plumbing in his meat and two veg since October last year, and he's still walking around with a bag on his leg, and wow. he's still waiting. And he's still waiting yeah. to be looked after. So that's the NHS yeah. in the UK. Uh, aging population, you know. And, to, to, and, and because of Brexit, of course, they lost a lot of people. Did I say mm. Brexit? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. You did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing is just technology. And like I said, I can't, I mean, I I, I, learned, I know probably more than what he, he alluded to because of the time we spent together in the in the Middle East. But the fact that what it does and does and does it well um, is fascinating. And I think yeah. more technology like that will get yeah. a healthier population. And more technology like that is going to appear. I mean, the idea of, of yeah. using AI to, to work on these diagnostics of all these different markers. Yeah. I mean, the eye is one thing, but then you can start feeding it uh, yeah. markers all across across the entire body. So, yeah, I, 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 I like to the one, one thing I like to say is that, you know, it's uh, at the core of the problem is not the you know diagnosis is which is there's never an attack on maybe because he alluded to that you can't really solve it is right. people have to change the way they 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 eat they and, live. And, and live oh yeah right, right? Yeah. So, that's a big thing yeah and yeah. i think that the second thing is that we went from a model where doctors cared because it was it was non-profit right and and the minute we changed to a a, a for-profit uh, healthcare system the whole thing went to hell, right? And now you yeah. have, now we have just consolidation of doctors into in, into practices that are, you know, uh, huge. And who's behind all that? It's the private equity boys. And what do they do? They just cut costs. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Cut, <laughs> cost, cut costs and flip it. That's all they do. Yeah. They do not add any value. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Period. The end. It's true. Right. No, I, my, I won't, yeah. there's no argument there. Yeah, but that's a, that's because we've become a society. Of, and once again, Gordon Gecko, greed is good. Everybody's like, how much money? How much money? Nobody really wants to help their fellow anything. I think this type of technology, and especially Jeff's company, if you're a provider and you can literally put this on in five minutes, I give a complete diagnosis, that. and that's why he got his code. I think at the end of the day, you're spot on. I mean, like at that point, yeah. you can actually do something. Um, and I think that becomes important. And I, and think I thought the really going to have to be a change. Sorry, Stan, I thought the really interesting thing about the, I mean, I was actually I can actually understand Jeff, and I mean yeah, in right. the nicest possible way, you know. So, so you can see why you know he's incredibly passionate, 
but he, it also it also every what all he said made a lot of sense as well. You think, yeah, come on, guys. You know, it was just it's almost as if you know, we were all smelling the coffee at the same time, which is a yeah, yeah. which is but also kind of good because yeah, some people don't drink coffee. So no, it was very very yeah. cool. I, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. So. Um, Many more to come. I, we'll find more tools yeah, like yeah. that. It's, it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. uh, you know me. I take a trip, and I meet. I make it. Yeah. I meet lots of people when I travel. So we'll bring some more people on. We're okay. talking to a few people that may come on. Hey, so really quick before we go into lost and found, um, social intercourse. The girl, the girl, the show with the two girls. They did a show Wednesday about are they bisexual? You know, if they're going to go from being, could they be with women? Now I don't want to say anything, but I'm going to. Um, you guys can't even be with men. So let's just assume you're not going to be with women. And they were talking how they can't be bisexual, but in their mind and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, stop. You're just, it's not happening. Um, so, but it's, yeah, if you need 35 minutes. Show, Steven, where can people watch the show? <laughs> <laughs> right. You can watch it, of course, on our channel. Just go to the playlist, look for social intercourse. Um, I think the title of the show is, am I, could I be bisexual? It was not that it's, 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 how do I put it? It was very funny but in an interesting way. And I know Rachel and Vicky, so I like to make fun of them because Rachel, once again, you're only this tall and we all know it. Um, so and I always make short jokes and she hates it. But I just thought it was funny. And I'm thinking to myself, this is very interesting because this is what women talk about, right? Guys don't talk about, could you be bisexual? No, we don't talk about that. We would never talk about that. But girls, I could be bisexual. And like the one show they did about toys, AI toys to pleasure themselves. Once again, if you can't find a man, and you can't find a toy, you're not going to find a woman. I'm just sorry. Yep. But anyway, so if you need 30 minutes of a good laugh, check out social intercourse. Am I bisexual? Um, and that should keep you in stitches. Plug, plug for the channel. Plug for another. another plug for, channel. I got to plug everything. Yeah. Well, I have okay. to. We have 93,000 subscribers now. Yes. So we have well, to that's well, let's, now, let's plug Lost and Found. You should plug that. I should plug that. Lost and Found. Then. Welcome to this week's Lost and Found. Uncovering Dollar Winners and Losers, where we discuss dollars lost and dollars gained by various companies and projects. Ah, oh, there we go. There we are. All right. John, are you ready today? Uh, I got, it's kind of a boring. Uh... Oh, we're not well, expecting we're, anything for that. That's a great, great intro. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of week to great, great, John. Every, every, <laughs> yeah. every, everybody's turned off the podcast now. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's gone, John. It's so just the all, four of us. This is just Allstate, for us. <laughs> Allstate uh, reported in, on Thursday that its May pre, pre-tax catastrophic losses were $1.4 billion for the month, and they were uh, attributed to uh, five wind and hail uh, events in Texas, Colorado, and Illinois. So wow. that's that's just you know, that is that is a lot of money for one month. You a know, billion in a month. Yeah, yeah one point wow. five billion in a month. You know, the previous month they reported four hundred and eighty-five million, something like that. That's great. So, well, usually they com- they complain about the losses during a hurricane season in Florida because you know it comes through, wipes out to whatever, and they're lost. We were eleven billion. But you know right. what's really funny? So they lost this one point something billion. Would you like to tell us how much you made in the other months? <laughs> yeah, well, the the year to date losses are two point six billion. So, uh, oh, all in. Okay, yeah. so they're not profitable this year. So Great it doesn't look like then. it. No, yeah. Good. I never liked them anyway. Good hands, people. My ass. So anyway. <laughs> you're not a sponsor. That was oh, they're not. They're a not sponsor. They're, they'll never sponsor after that. But you know who we like. <laughs> We like Geico because we like the little gecko. Anyway, Michael, what do you have? So that's a lost dollar. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Definitely, things. that's a lot. That's a lot of lost dollars there, John. But you know, John, I thought that was interesting. I liked it. So okay. I don't. You know, I don't know why you didn't think it was interesting. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, that was it's not like a quirky like should... David stuff. Oh no, David's no, no, going to no, do no. something where a cow is no. having sex with no. the moon, and, or you know, cow thinks it's bisexual. John, so, John I, I thought you'd at least be helping me to promote Dave's donuts. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Back. Michael, what do you have for us today? Well, I, you know, Dell. A lot of companies are are trying to get people back to the office, and Dell is one of the computer. Right, right. One of them. And uh, they had to, they actually forced their workers to classify themselves as remote workers or hybrid. But the, okay. the caveat was that. Not as uh, bisexual, though. They didn't have to say that. No, they, yeah, that one they didn't have to say. That wasn't on the form. <laughs> okay. 
but the thing is, if you said that you were a remote worker, then mm -hmm. you had to agree that you can no longer be promoted or hired into new roles within the company. Wow. Really? Half, half of the Dell workers chose that. Really? <laughs> Wow. Half of the Dell workers, based on a Business Insider report, said, "I don't care. I'm remote." And uh, yeah, and they're wow. probably all looking for jobs. So um, I was going to say, "Well, look at it this way: if you suck at what you do and you go, I'm not remote, you you could be a loser, and you could be the worst employee in the world. But because you show up at the office every day, you can actually get promoted." Hey, right. no Dell. Clever thinking Clever there. Thinking. You yeah. guys are like on top. No wonder your computers suck. So, so, so anyway. Michael, is it is that is that a plus or a minus then? Is yeah. it you know, well, you know for who? Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's a loss. For the for loser that. worker, it's a plus. For the worker that really works, it's a loss. And for the company overall, personally, I think that's a loss. Are you no, kidding? A loss what an idiot came up with that one? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. That's, that's, something. that's that's so stupid because you really just think about it. if you suck at what you do but you show up and that's you're the going criteria in. now going in. It's that's like, how it always is we got forty-seven thousand. we got the dumbest this guy in this corner or this girl whatever i don't want to be i don't want or this bisexual let's not i don't want to disclose right, anybody don't. here but whatever you are you're sitting in the corner and you're the dumb you can't even get your work done or you do and it's not right and they're like listen we need a vice president yeah right let's that's the guy because he comes in every day that's right. Not the guy who, whatchamacallit, not the guy who's like working his ass off remotely. I used to, like I said, I found remote people work harder than the people in the office, but what do I know? I know nothing. Uh, okay. there is, there's a report that came out this week uh, because in the UK and certainly here in, in holiday, don't care where you okay. are, you know, as, as, long as, you, as long as you do whatever you're supposed to do. But in the UK, they're trying to get everybody back in the office again. That's like the new thing. Yeah. Yeah. But there's yeah. a report that said people that are, people are happier. They work just as well as they do in the office. Mm -hmm. But actually, they're happier as people if they have hybrid or they work from home. Right. Yeah, because so, you can get more yeah, done. Get, I get yeah, more done more working at the house. Yeah. 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 I always get more done at the house because you know why? You can take breaks. You can do whatever. At the office, it's kind of like you feel this constant, I got to, got to, got And you don't have to got to, got to, got to. Hybrid's, hybrid's but, nice, though. I mean, it's nice to get as somebody who's been remote for, for, for probably eight years now. It's nice to have an office to go into once in a while, yeah. meet the team. Hybrid. But, yeah. but come on. If Dell, they know who you are, yeah. if they know who you are when you're wondering. Yeah. So well, not a Dell. Not yeah. a Dell. I listen, yeah. you know, Dell, good luck. Yeah. You'll be, at, you'll be like, won't get uh, promoted. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> cool. you don't, I bet you don't get a raise either if you're remote at Dell now. I'm sure they don't. No. You get nothing. So, Stephen, so if you're, what, but, what do we get from you this week? Are we? Uh, oh, uh, all right. So, two things, yeah. two things really quick. I just oh, want to be that'll, 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 that'll be a change. I <laughs> Depends who my lover is. Anyway, so here's here's two things really quick. Willie Mays, Willie, say say hey, Mays, passed away yeah, in 93. Good. Loved him. Watched him when I was a kid. And also Donald Sutherland passed away. Oh. So right, Donald yeah. Sutherland passed away. I think he was right. 88 so or 87. Is that, is that oh, no, wait, wait, wait. That stop. That? Those are just – I just wanted to mention that because Donald Sutherland oh. was in a movie called Kelly Heroes where he played Oddball. And I thought that was the best role I loved him and Willie Mays just because he was a true gentleman. Now, to the lost and found part. North Korea, John's favorite country, which he likes to visit often, and Russia have signed a pact. Putin and Missile Boy oh, signed yeah. a pact this week. It's an yeah. aggression pact. So if anybody attacks either or, they are going to fight. They're their own NATO, if you will. Um, and I thought that um, for them is a, is a dollar win. For the rest of the planet, dollar lost. So, yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting. That uh, the, that the North Koreans territory. and Russians are getting together. Well, I, you're literally getting back to the 1920s and 30s, and we keep saying it, but nobody listens because no one read a book. So we're getting <laughs> into that, like that pack of, you know, where yeah. this is how a world war starts, and nobody seems to get it. So it'll be interesting. Can't wait. So, all right, all right, right. Oh, let, it, let me let me buckle in. All right, David, I'm buckled yeah. in. Oh, I thought I thought I thought actually that the, the found dollar was for the. For the funeral parlors, I had two funerals to do this week, but uh, maybe I've just been cynical. Um, uh -huh. This, this, uh, this is something which is even this is incredibly important, um, oh and it's so important. I'm going to show it to you. So this is I, it's probably been out. It's probably been out in the US before. I've never seen it before. It's actually called they've called it a crisp pint. And people, uh, people, 
that they can't get enough of it on the internet. They want them to send them to them in the post. People are queuing up in the pubs to get them. And basically what it is, it's a, car, it's a carton holder that you put on, on your pint of beer and has a little bucket in front of it, which you can put your potato chips in so you can drink and eat your chips at the same time. Absolutely wow. brilliant. Brilliant cross-marketing. Cross because not only do, you know, you could have the... Every time somebody buys a beer, they're also advertising your crisps. Right. I think they're, I think they're called Lay's uh, everywhere else apart from the UK. Uh, but, you know, crisps are wonderful things as well because they get really salty and you drink even more beer. Not that the Brits yeah. need much encouragement to do that. So yeah. um, that was that was my little ditty. Well, you always yeah, want to have a snack with the drink. I mean, it makes wow. sense. Yeah. yeah. And now you don't have to carry it around. That's right. It's all, all organized for you. That's great. I see that people just fat and lazy in Britain. Consumer, awesome. yeah, exactly. This is the, the epitome, <laughs> yeah. the epitome of our technology. Epitome, <laughs> fat and lazy. Well, I love it. Well, That's well, David, well, and and you, that was also very cool because it wasn't about some cow saving the planet this time. So we're oh, very thank excited. you, thank well, you. I'll, I'll I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> well, take it for what you want, um, Michael. We have guests next week, or is it just the four muscatels? Or if Nick shows up because he's in South Nick's, by the way, in South Africa, everybody yeah. couldn't make it today. Apparently, the gerbil died. That runs the wheel that turns the power on in the country. As, as often, as often happens. As there. often happens. As often yes. happens there. But uh, but next week, actually, uh, which yeah. is the twenty eighth, uh, or yeah, the twenty eighth, we've got uh, Nadaj Vodka. Twenty ninth. Twenty ninth. I'm sorry. Twenty ninth is. Yes. The show. This yeah. is Hollywood 28. <laughs> Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. So we've got a vodka guest on the show, William Ooh. Clark. Okay. William Clark. He's going to be talking about this new vodka. I don't know how you make new vodka, but apparently he's doing I'm, it. Well, maybe, maybe he's going to have vodka and, um, you know, have some crisps holders to go with it as well. Wait, okay, do we get coffee. samples? Because we got to test this vodka out. I mean, like, how do we know it's any good? That's right. Yeah, we got to get some uh, somebody. Uh, we don't have samples. This is uh, it'll yeah. be a short interview. We'll go. I right, grab a bottle of scotch. Then you know, screw that. Come on. <laughs> well, you always do that. You always do that. Uh, stop it. That's the cigar <laughs> show, which is on right after this show, by the way. And you'll be happy to know that the cigar show now other co-host is a cigar sommelier. So not only do you have Riz and I, who know yeah. nothing about cigars, but we have a sommelier now of cigars. And he literally goes through cigar stuff. And that's like, wow. Amazing. So if you're into cigars, scotch, and that's hot naked show. girls, that's the show for you. Minus the hot naked girls. I just said I, that I would, to get people's attention. I actually found out that he was a Pakistani gentleman and not a Somalian. But that's probably just me. But, uh, there you go. Oh. Yeah, this is my life. And on <laughs> that note. On that, that note. <laughs> thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like. And seriously. We have 93,000 subscribers. We're inching up close to 100. Um, yeah. Insert your name here, but we can't do it without you. And to all the hosts, not just on this show, but all our shows, thank you very much. Because without them, we don't have this. So Subscribe we'll see you all next Saturday morning. And there you go. Bye, everyone.